people get spell over so wrong, but the bar just isn't that high in poker. If you really dedicate yourself and you really, really work hard in the public solver era, how many new players have came up and reached the high stakes? If you can't figure out how to beat 200 and now with good fundamentals, like what's going on, right? Today's guest on Chasing Poker Greatness has two WSOP gold bracelets, as well as almost $9 million in lifetime MTT caches, Mr. Justin Saliba. Justin is one of my favorite human beings to discuss poker strategy and the state of poker with. He's one of the head honchos uh, at PokerCoaching.com. He battles in the 25K up to, I believe, 250K buy-in tournaments all around the globe. Um, recently participated in Triton and had his first million dollar score. We're going to talk about how solvers can make human beings much worse at poker if used incorrectly and much, much more. So without any further ado, I bring to you Super High Roller Regular, one of the best multi-table tournament poker players in the entire world, Mr. Justin Saliba. Mr. Saliba, how you been, sir? Good, man. Good. How are you doing? I'm doing really, really well. It's great having you back on. It's been quite a long time. Uh, I know that since last time, I think I believe last time you had just won your first bracelet, right? I, I don't remember exactly when it was, but yeah, it's, it's been it's been a few years. A couple of years ago. Um, yeah. You've since won a second bracelet, correct? Yep. And you had a million dollar score. Um, I did. Tell me, tell me about the million dollar score. That one's gotta gotta feel pretty nice. That that was cool. That was really cool. Um, it was in Montenegro, which is like one of my favorite places in the world. Now, I, I'd never been before, but like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> surprise, even, surprise. <laughs> yeah. Even even pre-score, like it's just that part of the world is just amazing. Like, I think I've been I've been working on traveling well because it's just it is it does take a lot out of you if you just like show up on a Tuesday and it's a twelve-hour time change and you just like try to play really well on Wednesday, you know. So I went five days early to this trip and enjoyed Croatia with with some friends and just like wasn't taking poker so seriously like in the in the prep I felt like a sprinter a little bit where it's like you work really hard and then you like kind of chill out for like three days and then you like go and perform and so I just like felt really good going to the series and then I think it was a 50k yeah it was, I think it was a 50k and uh and yeah man I, I that turn was awesome and ran super hot got very lucky and uh got heads up with Amadi we played we played one hand and he, he, no, no chop from no chop, and uh, played one <laughs> hand for a pile of money, and and ended up getting second for for one point one. So it was, yeah, great experience, a lot, a lot of fun. Do you do you find that cadence of you know kind of like ramping up and then tapering off before the event? Um, is that something that you consistently do while you're traveling to these various locations? I, I'm trying to get better at it. You know, this is something I talk. I have like a, a sports psychologist type type guy, and one thing that he was saying. One thing that he was recommending that I wasn't doing very uh, a very good job of was like in sports you like you warm up, you perform, you cool down, and then you rest and, and you and you train right. And like I had no cool down and no warm up. Like in my process was just like work really hard, get ready for this tournament or this tournament series, or stay sharp, go perform at a high level, and then like rest hardcore. And like my emotional swings were just like not handling it super well. So I'm trying to get better at like having kind of a warm up like. Like just doing like 30 minutes a day for a few days, you know, or just like kind of doing some like lighter stuff to kind of get, get my, myself moving a little bit. And then after the series, having kind of a cool down and not just like doing no poker, but you know, just doing a little bit, just like kind of cooling down. And, and, uh, and I think that process has been way more sustainable for me than, than, than the zero to a hundred all the time. Tell me about the, you know, your warm up. What does that, what does that look like for you? Yeah. So like, I, I want to get to a place early now. Um, a lot of these high stakes tournaments are played across the world. So it's like, I, I want to show up early and make sure my sleep schedule is like at least somewhat moving in, in the right direction. Um, and then a warm up is just not, not super hardcore studying. I'm not trying to like learn new mechanics or like change my strategy in a hard way. I'm just trying to like increase my sharpness. And so increase my sharpness might just be like working on like a, a simple spot. I know very, very well, like a 40 big blind button versus big blind or something. And I'm just like training it for 25 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, and, and just like feeling good, feeling confident in my strategies, and then and then just getting well rested and and uh, getting in the right mindset to to kind of go perform. And then, uh, what does your cool down look like after after the event? Yeah, cool down. I just need to schedule my life a little bit. I think that what was happening is I would like fly back home and 
and literally just go hundred to zero. You know, I'd get home and I would have nothing on my plan. I'd want to rest and and just be like, okay, I'm going to sleep for a few days. And all of a sudden, it's kind of like a uh, emotional dump a little bit. So I just really try to schedule my day. So even if it's like, okay, I get back at nine p.m. at eleven a.m. I'm going to have lunch with with a friend. Um, at three p.m. I'm going to go get this haircut I've needed for a while, and then at and then at five p.m. I'll like watch thirty minutes of a live stream and take some notes. And just like even if it's like such a little amount of work. It's just something to kind of have add structure to my life, like in that cool down phase. Um, and it kind of like allows me to get to rest a, a little bit better than just like flying home and having nothing to do and and uh, and the emotions kind of can dump off. Yeah. Tell, tell me about the emotional aspect. You know, I, you know, the I, I think it's very easy for folks to see the the technical side of, you know, the equivalent of when I when I go to like watch a basketball game or something and everybody's like, you know, running their layup drills and shooting threes like pregame and warming up um, kind of the poker equivalent of that. Right. Um, from a technical side, but uh, for, for my students and for, you know, the wolves, one thing that I preach a lot about is, um, you know, having a cool down specifically um, where essentially you lightly review the hands that you played in your previous session and you kind of just go through them so that you can get yourself kind of back to back to baseline, back to e- more even killed emotionally, because it's really easy to win four buy-ins and be like, oh, I'm the poker king of the world. Like nobody can crush me. And then like when you so you're like way up high and then when they review, you're like, oh, well, I coolered the shit out of them twice. And I flopped the set ver- like I flopped the set versus aces in a three about pod and like a whale just punted a stack to me. And it's like, well, maybe I'm not the king of the world. And like I, I just like ran really hot. Right. So like. Um, you kind of come back down. Um, and then when you get buried, uh, you're obviously down here and then maybe it's the other side, right? Where you like get set over set or you, you lose a flip or two or, you know, whatever happens. And so you're feeling really low and this kind of helps you get back up to baseline because like when you're really high and things go poorly, it goes very bad emotionally. Like it, it is an emotional gut punch. It feels awful. Um, and then also, like, when you're really low, it's really easy to lose confidence, really easy to feel like you're a bad poker player, you forgot what you were doing. Um, and so, like, just maintaining getting back to even emotionally, like, not not technically at all, but just emotionally um, is something that I preach really heavily. So, yeah, tell, tell me about, you know, your emotions and regulating your emotions, especially playing these gigantic buy-in events. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's, it's so funny. I, I said this, I kind of was joking with a friend the other day and I just said that it was so funny because I felt like I spent just like seven years every day working on my technique to all of a sudden, just like spend the last year of my life, just focus on the most simple things of like, do I want to play today? You know, am I excited about this tournament? How can I handle this? Like, is this guy ever bluffing? You know what I mean? Like the, the things in my head now compared to like the whole process up to it felt feel like such a funny, like kind of a funny occurrence with it. So like one thing early on that I've gone back and forth on is in terms of the emotional stuff, I did what I thought I was supposed to do, which was kind of be numb to it and like suppress all the emotions, focus on just like making the highest DV play I can, not worrying about variance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then the emotional swings in that in that kind of life like were very low, um, but then I kind of realized that that wasn't the best thing for me. Uh, I don't think that like all poker players see it the same way. There's obviously plenty of guys in the high stakes. They're still just like, oh, we, I don't care if I run hot or run cold or whatever. I think that for me, like to play my A game, I need to like care at a very high level, and so that led itself to like way more swings right away. But I felt like overall benefit. Like I was like just. You know, like Jason Kuhn or some of these guys, like the two that come to mind for me are Jason Kuhn and Amadi. Like they both want to win so badly. And and sometimes they like will rage a little bit or like have a, you know, not rage, but you know what I mean? Like be, be a little overly emotional or stuff. But I kind of get the benefit, right? Like when there's eight left off the table, I can understand that I'm not going to win the tournament very often. But I think it's like only beneficial to feel like I'm always going to win the tournament. You know, it just like will lean, like will push you to like be making slightly better decisions and, and, and like trying really, really hard to like find the right answers. And so from that came more emotional swings. So I've had to learn to like deal with it kind of again, as I'm like letting it kind of like be out there and and whatnot. Um, So I try really hard in game to feel like I have a lot of control and really be competitive and like really care about winning. 
And then off the table, I just, I try to really work hard to like remind myself about the math of it, remind myself about the data and the, and the kind of science of it and try to have that emotional and data balance that, that kind of keeps me steady. Yeah. I love that. And, you know, it gives you an edge, right? I, I think like what we're looking for is, is an edge to, so that we can invest more energy into being in the moment, being present and seeing everything that's in front of us because we genuinely care. Like I know that in my cash game career, whenever I've tried to like switch my emotions off, it just doesn't work because I, I end up playing worse. I end up not picking up on a timing tell that I would have if I really, really cared about getting stacked or not getting stacked or winning the maximum. Like if I were locked in, I would have noticed that. But when I shut it off, I, I miss things. And when I start missing things, my EV goes down, my win rate goes down. Like I, I've just never had good results when I didn't care about the results at all, like me personally. Yeah, absolutely. And and like like to me, I felt like I had to train that back in because like I was always very competitive growing up, but I felt like I'd kind of numbed it. And then like not to be too uh not to be too dark or anything, but like the way I was like training it back in was like this river decision, if I get it wrong, it's like I die. You know what I mean? Like it's as important. It's like the stakes of this decision are so freaking important that I have to get it right. And when you kind of put that in your head over and over and over, like you do care more, you are more intense, you are finding more good answers. Like, like this last year's main event, I, like th- this is not like a, to, to say a bad beat. I, I got it in Kings to Aces pre and anybody else would be like, yeah, of course it's fine. Whatever. 60 picks. If you put a gun to my head, it, it's just that the stakes weren't high enough. The stakes were not high enough for me on day one of the main to really care about making the right decision. Whereas if you put a gun to my head, I would have just folded. Like if you're like, you have to make the right play here. He either has aces or he has anything else, right? If the stakes were so high, I would have just made the right decision. And like, if that stuff is happening, like a 10 K main, like how much more is it happening in, in all, all across other events? So yeah, putting that intensity kind of back in, um, I think is like a massive, massive edge to, for, for me personally. And there's also, you know, that, that spot is very interesting to me because there's an, a built-in excuse for getting stacked with kings versus aces that I that I think like people just kind of like lean into where it's like, well, you know, if if I if they have aces and I get it in with kings, nobody can really question this. Nobody can say that I played the hand bad, and so like you're just you you just like talk yourself into into doing it because you have a justification. Um, when I think if you're operating at the highest level you do things that other people are like, what? Like, that doesn't make any fucking sense. Like, how did you do that, right? Like, why did you do that? Um, But I think for folks that really train hard, that want to play exceptional poker at the highest of levels and grab all the edges, are able to do those things that other people think are wacky or weird or you just can't do it. Like, it's it's not like, you can't fold Kings Pre. Like, you know, um. And I think somebody, I can't remember who said it, but, but they said like, if, if everybody understands everything that you do, where does your edge come from was, and that's sure. something that kind of like stuck with me where it was like, you know what? That's true. Like, so when I'm playing, I'm going to trust my intuition. I'm going to trust my training, everything I've learned about the game over time to do what I think is right. Not outsource it to anybody else, not outsource it to a solver, not outsource it to my friend. I'm going to do what I think is best. And you know what? Like, when I go to sleep at night and lay my head on the pillow, I can sleep well knowing that I did it. I trusted myself. I went with my instinct um, and then just let the cards fall where they may from there. Yeah. And, and, and like we're talking about emotions, like think about the amount of confidence that you need to do that. Like early on when I was playing some of my first high stakes tournaments, of course you care. Right. I, of course, I care what Chidwick thinks about the way I'm playing or, or Haxton or Nikki P or these guys. Right. Like I have looked up to these guys for years and years. So it's like it's so natural um, to care. And so you have to fight against all these like kind of natural things and train yourself to like like, like I call it like war mode or like like, you know, war mode, battle mode, whatever. Like you have to be in this place where you're so abundantly confident that you do not care. You can be on a stream with thousands of people watching playing for millions of dollars. If it enters your head that like you're like oh well like this could look funny, you're fucked up, right? Like like you're you're not there. You're not. And think about the edge. Like like the best players do not care about that stuff. And it's so abundantly clear that guys like I have a joke with some some guys that like I don't want to take action in guys below twenty five, 
They can be the best online player in the world. I don't want their action until they're above 25. And it, it, they're like, I don't want to swap, you know, whatever. It, it's like kind of a joke, but there's some truth to it as well. It's like, it's like, it just takes a little bit of time to like be in those spots and develop that confidence that you can make a play that you think is really good. And if you're a great player, you're going to find all sorts of plays that there is no, no, no solver is going to tell you that you, what you did was right. No one's going to look at it and understand it unless they're really, really paying attention. Um, and, and that's also why, like you talk about judgment of characters, right? Like people can look at a hand that Chidwick plays and it's so easy to criticize. It's so easy to be like, oh, this is weird. The solver says this. He did that. It's like, dude, you think you're going to trust like your three minutes of caring about the spot or the guy that's made tens of millions of houses all over the world from playing cards, right? It's like people are just, it's such a massive crutch. You're the thing that you're saying about like, oh, it looks normal to bust King's to Aces or it looks normal to bluff with the ace too off in the spot or, or whatever it might be or rejam this hand. It's like, dude, the, the guys that are thinking of that level, like in my chan- in my mind, like they have, they have very little chance um, at, at the highest stakes. Yeah. They're, they're, they're just dead from, from the jump. Yeah. Um, yeah and- it's such a crutch. I mean, solvers, all that stuff is like, can be such a crutch if used incorrectly. And then that is really what, what can like kill people. And like when you're studying, I, I think it's a very sterile environment that is not really super dynamic. Um, and then when you actually play poker live, there are so many data points that you never train for, that you, you never see, that you never expect. Um, you know, like in a, in a cash game, right? Like opening, opening somebody three bets and then a whale flats the three bet cold, like from the small blind. Okay. Good luck finding a solve to figure that out. And this is a thing that happens like routinely, right? Um, yeah. you know, five ways to a flop, 300 bigs deep, um, two whales and, you know, three regs. Like these, these things happen so often, or like Somebody will open a size that is not a normal size, and that's going to shift your strategy in some way. Um, and I mentioned before, like, you know, timing tells, uh, just metagame. Like, there's so many details and things that can lead to a decision. I, I think that what, what's most interesting to me about, like, the, the Chidwick, um, you know, the, the, the Chidwick example that you gave is I like thinking, like, what what did they know? What what were they prioritizing? Like, how yeah. did they get there? Because clearly, they didn't just, like, flip a coin and be like, oh, I'm just going to do something really wacky. Like, uh, Kristen Foxen's bust-out hand. I, I actually like, well, I wonder what led to that decision. Like, she wasn't just, like, guessing. It, it wasn't just a random thing that she did. There was some reason why she jammed, you know, second pair in a gut shot um, beyond what is obvious. And that's always been, like, the most interesting thing to me, especially from these like, you know, top tier level pros. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and that's not to say that people don't make mistakes. I mean, I make mistakes all the time, but both the players you mentioned make, make mistakes constantly. That's one conclusion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's such a lazy conclusion, right? Sure. Like, so I just want to take that as a caveat. Yeah. Like, everybody makes mistakes. The game's very difficult. But with that said, the mindset of looking at the spots and whatever, the, the people that are just constantly finding errors in other people's play, it's just, it's such a massive waste of time. It's, it's, uh, it's so, so much more beneficial to think about what they're thinking about. What, why, why did they do it? Kristen has played millions of poker hands. She obviously is thinking that like certain things are operating a certain way. She probably thinks that he's betting too thin for value and going to fold any single ways without extra equity, right? Like she has to be thinking certain things like that, or maybe he's opening really wide and has way more just like low middling cards that, that play this way. Um, yeah, not, yeah, it's 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 always going to be more beneficial to try to figure out why they're why they're doing what they're doing. Sure, and, and that's it's... the same thing with solvers, right? Like, like people get solvers so wrong. It's it's so it's funny because like my online name was was just GTO. Okay, when I came up in in the game, it's like 2017. I read Will Tipton books. I was into Munker Solver. I was into Pio. I, I was like extremely um, technical. Like my, my, we talked about this before my six back strategy, I could have written down on, on pieces of paper. I was extremely just like, um, technical and, and solver oriented. And then as like data has become more easily accessible and whatnot, the mindset behind solvers is just insane. Like, like you're talking about this cold call spot, like people are like, oh, well, well this will play like this spot or whatever. It's like, dude, you need like the purpose of solvers and studying and all that stuff has to be to make your brain into a solver. Like you should just be able to have any inputs that come to you at the table and try to just do your best at solving it in game for what's best based on the inputs and the abstraction that you're seeing in real life. And a big part of that skill 
is extrapolating certain things you're seeing in game from players into different inputs for different spots, right? That way you can play against them very well. And and yeah, the mindset of like, oh, this is right or this is wrong is like, it's just such a massive mistake for people. Yeah, but we, we think in binary ways, I think. We love judging other people too. Like that that's like a human trait that humans just love judging judging other people. Um, for a long time, like I've said, and this is, it, it feels controversial to say, but like, I think that not enough um, pros actually think about like what Phil Hellmuth does right um, to get the results that he gets, right? They just kind of like discount what he does and kind of just make fun of him. And like, yes, like I, I've seen some like cash game Phil Hellmuth and and I, I can say that it's it's not always um, on the world-class level, but sure. clearly he's done something right over many years. And speaking of somebody that like actually cares about winning, like that that's kind of the prime prototypical example of somebody that yeah uh always has the gun to his head in pretty much every tournament that i've seen him in um playing playing with that kind of edge yeah Uh, so yeah yeah, like i i think that yeah just learning from others and really thinking deeply about what they're doing and sometimes you come to the conclusion they're like oh i think they just made a mistake and like that's like once you exhaust all the other possibilities and think about every all the variables in play that is a that is a conclusion you can come to, but I think like you take it to the next step. Yeah, yeah. You just got to do a lot yeah, of sure. work. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. We cut out there for a second, but like sure. even take it to the next step for that. It's like, um, you know, why did they make that mistake? Yeah, what does why? that mean about how they're going to play other spots? Like, does it mean that I can you know barrel more against them? Should I barrel less against them? Should I barrel a different range shape? Should I have more equity or less equity? Right? Like, yeah. It's it's uh it, it's way too lazy to just be like, oh, yeah, mistake done. Two seconds. Mm-hmm. Right. Send it to your friends, send it to all your group chats, make yeah. yourself feel better about why like you should be playing the five Ks now or the ten you know what I mean? Like whatever price point it is. Like Yeah, yeah everybody it's, uh, LOLs. It's yep. a, that's a super great point too, especially in like the small field high rollers, where you do need to know like if you find a mistake and it is in some sort of common core node, like you need to understand what led to that mistake so that in the future you can deal with it and you can push them towards that node or, you know, respond in a much better way in the future, which by the way, can lead to a wacky thing that somebody from the outside watching is like, why on God's earth did they do that when you you don't understand what went into that decision beforehand? Absolutely. Everybody has tendencies. Uh, Like everybody gives off live stuff, like live tells and everybody has tendencies. Like that's something I really believe. Yeah. It doesn't matter how good you are. You can be number one in the world you're still going to have tendencies on, on ways you, you like to approach spots and, and like little nodes that you're going to play a little bit differently and, and what. Yeah. We're human beings. And that's, yeah. that's the beauty of poker that, that we're human beings. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That, that's, that's, uh, that's one thing that I think people get so wrong about the high stakes. It's just like very funny. Everyone's like, Oh, they're like, can't be edged. They're all like these GTO guys. Like they're all playing it. Dude, the different groups and the high stakes are playing so different. Their approach to tournaments is so different. Their approach to emotions and mindsets is so different. Like, it's it's crazy to me that that uh, people think players play the same. A guy like Ponikovs has a lot of different tendencies um, than a guy like Jason Kuhn. The way that you know Nikki P plays final tables is just going to be different than a guy like Alex Kula. All of them are playing the super high rollers. You know what I mean? And it's like the the, the approaches and stuff are, are just going to be a lot different and. And yeah, there's way more variety than I think people people give it credit for. Yeah, but we'll watch a, a sport like baseball, right? And realize that like, oh, guys have different stances. They they do things differently. Every, everybody's like, a, they have their own quirks. They like po- poker's the same. Like the game Gosh. tree in poker is so big that it there's enough room for people to put their own spin on things. And and that to me is like part of the, the beauty and the art uh, of playing poker that just, yeah, makes it in my opinion one of the best games in the world yeah, totally. um, tell me about the triton experience that's got to be got to be a fun experience going and playing in the in the triton events yeah yeah i mean it's my favorite place to play they it, it's just amazing i mean everything about it is amazing you have great hosts you have great people that work there amazing dealers amazing staff they treat you great they kind of know what um what people want there it's it's all kind of high end and and we want to play high stakes and and uh, and nice places, and that's kind of the the trite and vibe of things. They pick great resorts, great places to play poker, and 
and you get to play high stakes for weeks on end. It's it's extremely intense. It's definitely the most intense um, poker trips that that I think are out there. You're just playing unbelievably high stakes for like two weeks straight. So it's there's not much downtime. You're just trying to get sleep in your downtime for the most part. What does a day look trying like? Trying to stay sharp. What's a day look like there? Um, tournaments start at typically like 2 p.m. I think with restarts at noon. And so, and they run until maybe midnight, um, sometimes later. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would just like my typical days, I'd, I want to wake up and try to get like a meal in and do something to kind of like relax my mind and put myself in like a new a new mindset a little bit. Like I, I try to view every tournament like a new life almost, you know, it's like, uh, it doesn't matter what happened yesterday, good or bad, like today's like a new life. I just like take it for what it's worth and we want to be be sharp and in a good mindset come, come when the cards are dealt. Uh, and then you just like play for eight hours. You have a nice dinner break with usually like awesome food and stuff. And then at the end of the day, I'll try to like just find some sort of cool down and, and get to sleep. There's not too much to it, honestly. Nice. Nice. It... There's some te- there's some tennis in the mornings and some games and things like that that people will play. Um, so don't get me wrong. There's def- I guess there's definitely some like gym time and, and spa and whatnot. But for the most part, it's I'm only focused on trying to optimize to play my best in these eight hours or these 10 hours or whatever it might be. Is there cash games? Like there's, there's so amount of cash games. I've never played uh, the cash games there. I think it's a lot of like um, built lineups, sometimes streamed. What well, one of the sickest, uh, not, not to tangent this, but one of the sickest things I ever saw was I left Montenegro a day early. I didn't play the 200 K. It was, yeah, I had a great series, but I was just, I was exhausted by whatever, 12 days in. And I was going to skip the 200K and fly back home. And I had a flight at like maybe seven in the morning. And so I'm in the lobby at like five in the morning. And all of a sudden, uh, Limitless and Limitless is walking down the stairs from the casino. You know, he say, say bye, you know, good luck. He made the final table of the of the 200K. And then later I realized that both Amadi and Limitless final table the 200k with like 4.8 million up top okay and after the day one was over at like 9 p.m or 10 p.m they played 1k 2k cash or something like that until five in the morning the next day and then they went and played the 200k and went one and two for like 4.8 and like three million i was like hey, these guys that was like one of the most insane things i've like ever just like cursory seen you know like like that these guys are just beasts man they're just absolute beasts yeah i it's funny. I I um, I think in a previous episode was talking about uh, Jay Wynn, who um, makes content for for poker coaching. Yeah, uh, he flew into like one of our retreats and ha- flew in on no sleep, landed, came to the cab. Uh, he didn't even come to the cabin. He went straight to the casino and played like one two no limit at like nine p.m. until like four in the morning until he finally made his way back to the cabin. Woke up at like eight in the morning and then like went and played a tournament. Um, wow. and I was like, dude, like, I don't think I've ever loved poker as much as you or playing <laughs> poker. Like that's just almost inhuman. Like how, how some people just love, like just live and love going and playing poker and will play on no sleep and will not optimize anything. Um, just for love of the game. I, 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 I just, I admire that. I wish that maybe I had a little bit more of that in me, but in another yeah. sense, I, I'm glad that I don't because it, <laughs> it seems quite painful um, at yeah. times. But yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's like everything. Different people get energy from different things, right? And like when I'm really enjoying it, and when I'm really in the zone, I'm really really playing well. I could play poker for 40 hours. You know, it's like it gives you energy to like get dealt cards and be making decisions and all that stuff. And then when you see people break, like I, I think that there's. Even at the highest stakes, people break, right? Like, like the pressure, the fatigue, the all this stuff becomes too much. The streams, the uh, the stakes, like everything about it. And you'll see that when that happens, it feels like it takes so much energy to play. You know, it takes so much out of you to play a final table or whatever. Whereas, like when you're really in the flow and you're enjoying it, you, it gives you energy to play. You know, and so I have to like reflect on that for me as well. Like um, when I'm high energy, I want to travel everywhere. I want to play every high stakes tournament. And when I'm low energy, I need to like recoup and kind of like get back into a space where I'm, I'm going to be enjoying it again because it, it's really hard to win in poker when when you're not happy to be there. You're not like super excited about the tournament or whatever. Yeah, once you kind of lose all of your momentum, it takes time to get going again. And I think like 
for you know type A personalities that want to just go 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 and hammer hammer hammer, we undervalue rest and recovery and just doing nothing right like just like going to the park just doing like just chilling out relaxing you know not setting goals just like it's very rejuvenating and very necessary Um, yeah yeah there's something petrangelo told me like a couple months ago that was like pretty impactful to me was that uh, we're talking about like books and what like books we're reading and i was reading like some self-help book at night i don't remember which one it was but maybe like uh whatever outlive or something i was like learning i was trying to like learn and get better and stuff yeah and he was like is there any part of your day where you're like not just trying to improve and i was just like well like i I guess not like maybe not like i guess i can wake you up and studying and doing these different things where i'm just like really trying to improve throughout the day and so i ended up just like buying a random fictional book and like i'm trying to get the process of just like letting my mind wander at night you know it's like not everything you do needs to be to improve or to get better whatever it might be a lot of it should be, but but not everything, you know? Yeah, not everything. I, I, I'm a big fan of fiction. And I think one thing that fiction does, it's it lets you escape into kind of another world. Um, but also like reading, I think, does flex like your creative muscles. You've got to like build things in your mind because it's it's you don't have the screen. Um, and there's it, 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 it. I think it is beneficial, even though it doesn't always feel like you're moving towards some objective if you're not reading something that's nonfiction and, you know, personal growth and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was looking at your Hendon mob. You, you got some deuce to seven low ball, some big <laughs> O caches at the WSOP. Tell, tell me about this, the deuce to seven low ball. Where, where did that come from? Yeah. So after Jeju, Triton Jeju, I did um, EPT Paris. I flew to Taipei and I went to Jeju and the swings in Jeju were just massive. I, I had a, a big stack in the 125k main, which was the biggest 100k plus buy-in ever that ran. Um, and I immediately fly home, and I like was having like a little bit of um, a tough time getting back into my process. And something somebody told me was like, "Why don't you go play poker for fun?" Mm. And and so I just went and started playing poker for fun. And I was like, "Okay, well, like, let me play these weird carnival games and and you know mixed games." And I went to like a, you know Robbie uh, Straczynski, really good guy. Mm. Yeah, he brought like the mixed game festival. Mixed game festival. Yeah. I, I went there and started playing some of that. So I kind of like got into mixed game as just like a way to like enjoy and love poker again. Um, and then I kind of got the bug a little bit. I, I'm not a great player by any means, but I uh, I got some coaching and pl- started playing like heads up online mixed and and try to learn the games. Deuce of seven triple is my favorite game. I play the most. You have these uh, old school guys that are kind of happy just to, like sit and hold lobbies at deuce seven heads up. Yeah. And so like it's the game you can get the most uh, volume in. And these guys are hilarious because it's like, like I'll make a play and they'll be like, you're an idiot. Like, <laughs> do you know what like two is greater than one or whatever it is? You know? <laughs> and so it's it's just like kind of a fun fun thing for me. And I I think like goals wise, I want to go after WSP Player of the Year at some point. And you kind of have to be playing these 10Ks. So um, I added a few games this past year. And then before next WSP, I'll add a, a few more probably. So I just think every year I want to like have something that extends my mind and like gets me excited about uh, about something more outside of no limit um and so yeah that was that was how that was that this dude's seven turn was hilarious dude because like i was so uh, like amped to play this tournament it was the game i played the most and i felt really good at the start and then like towards the end of the tournament the structure is so slow and these guys are so good it was literally just like me and six of the best deuce of seven players in the world and i'd played like a hundred deuce of seven hands live in my entire life yeah you know so it was <laughs> It was a humbling experience. It was like whatever me, Ivy, Benny Glazer, Internet ninety three, uh, like uh, uh, the Brazilian guy Renan. Mm-hmm. Like it was just all these like absolute crushers and do seven, and then I'm just like <laughs> playing every hand pretty slow, really trying to think through my strategy. Like I, I was dead deep in the tournament, but it was it was a lot of fun. Tell um, tell me about that um, transition to mixed games and taking kind of what you know from you know your main game. And then applying that to these other games, uh, because I find, you know, um, the the Wolves, we've been transitioning to PLO a little bit. We've been learning and growing and getting better. And I find that actually the learning curve is not not so bad transitioning to these other games, because most forms of poker work in a very similar way. Um, and when you understand kind of how the game works, the other games kind of make sense. So I was going to wonder, like, you know, how are you approaching that? What do you feel uh, is transferable 
from your main game to these other games? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I would say the number one thing is that I just have a lot of confidence in my process. Like mm -hmm. my process of learning and improving, I, I think it's very strong. And so like, I like to start games heads up. I like to record my screen and go through every single hand, run the equities, get coaching, try to improve every single day across whatever it is. Why heads up? I, I, I like heads up because you get so many hands in and it just like helps me understand the hand strength. You know, like when you're playing he heads up, like you have to play a lot of hands. You have to understand like that you can't just like fold a bunch and play premiums. If you just play like nine max cash, it's going to be a lot slower to like really kind of get into it. If you play three handed cash, you're just going to learn how to build ranges a lot. It's a lot tougher and you're going to do a lot better job of it. It's way easier to go from button to big blind and become exceptional at it and then move to low jack to big blind, right? It's like, it's not that difficult, but it, it becomes really difficult um, to, to do the opposite, I would say. So I, like that was how I was a no limit too. I played a lot of heads up and then moved to cash. Um, and I just think it's like really good to like get a lot of hands in and also like get that competitive nature. It's like, okay, I want to get good at this game. I want to beat this guy. Like I want to figure out how how and why and and to do certain things. So um, I would say the number one thing is that like, I, I really believe my process um, of learning new things and learning new games. And then in terms of transferable nature, that one's a little bit tougher. I mean, like with my background and no limit, I've always been pretty big on like equity graphs and, and equity distributions and, and thinking about the game kind of that way. So it is it is that way, but in mix, it's it's very mechanical or it's much more mechanical, I would say. Um, so yeah, there's definitely some overlap in the certain strategies, like, and it's like just more pushing mechanical. equity. It's more mechanical because of the Ponlots model of the yeah you know, yeah just the limited bet sizes. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I would say that like there were some cool things I was finding about pushing equity. You know, in like limit hold'em, you have to like obviously really really push equity. Um, and there were certain no limit things that came from that where I was like, okay, like against this player type, pushing equity becomes really good. And then I was noticing certain players in no limit that play more that way. Like there's certain groups that I think like push equity way, way more than, than a computer would, you know? And so it's like, okay, well, this idea of like pushing equity and, and, uh, ac across different boards and whatnot, I think like kind of opened my mind to some ideas about that. So there's definitely some transferable skills, but, um, definitely just like the process I would say is the, is the biggest thing that just keeps giving me confidence in, in, in my process. Nice. I love that. And I, I would say here's like a very, this is an interesting thing because it's kind of the opposite um, as we play more PLO and as, as I learn more about PLO, I've started to take PLO concepts and bring them to my Hold'em game. Um, and also I think I, I played a lot of limit Hold'em because there, there actually was no, like no limit Hold'em cash when I first started playing poker. So I was forced to play a lot of limit Hold'em. And I think that there are still things that I've taken away from my limit Hold'em days that I apply to my no limit game. Um, in you know, kind of niche scenarios that 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 arise, where I'm like, oh, this is like a limit hold'em concept that like, you know, I I get, I understand, it makes sense, um, and then I apply it. So yeah, like uh, that that's just kind of a weird thing where it's like, in PLO, a lot of times I, I think unlike hold'em, you you merge um, a lot more. There's like a lot more merging, um, and then like taking the the merging concepts from PLO, applying them to hold'em, and better understanding how they work. Um, I just find has, has helped me become a holistically stronger Hold'em player, which is nice. a, kind of a weird thing to say because I'm playing a different game. Yeah, I wonder if you're going to find well, one thing that I noticed, in, and I haven't played like all that much six max PLO, but I whatever twenty thousand hands probably. Like, yeah. I actually find that I'm guessing you're going to see that the population tendencies are quite similar. Like river probes for small sizes just go really well. You know, like pot on the turn versus about seventy on the turn probably gets an overfold you know like i i think that you're going to find like population stuff isn't all that different which which i'll be interested to check back on in, in maybe a couple of years oh it's already been found sir We're... yeah cool <laughs> we, yeah it's, it's already it's already been found um i can off off the record i can i can give you so, some of the lo lowest hanging fruit of plo but but those those kinds of things are there and i think like yes. one one primary difference in plo and hold'em is like how many card like how many raw hands are available, right? There's something like, I'm not, uh, 12 or 1300, um, no limit hands. In PLO, there's like millions. I think it's like two or three million <laughs> like different hands. Maybe it's less like unique hands, 700,000 or something. Yeah. So like when it comes to like the combinatorics of it, it's really easy to overdo something in one way or the other because like, oh, 
you're VPIPing 50% of the hands. And so like when a straight is available, well, now like you don't have like 16 pure combos of eight, nine because the button yes. opened and you called. Now you've got like 70,000 combos of eight, nine <laughs> in your range. And like, sure. that means that like, if you only take an aggressive action in, in a spot, like a straight completer with eight, like it's very, very, very easy to under bluff uh, yeah. or to, to, to under bluff. And in other spots, it's very, very easy to overfold um, because again, you've got so many of these like various combos that can't hold up uh, yeah. facing like yeah. bet, bet, bet. For sure. Makes it fun. It, it does like make it fun. It, it's a fun challenge. Like I, I'm really, I, I'm leaning into the challenge of learning a new game and I'm really, really, really enjoying it. Um, yeah. and tur- tournaments are next. As we, we talked go. about in the pre-call, tournaments are going to be the next adventure after PLO. Um, yeah. Tell me about what's going on with PokerCoaching.com these days. What, what do y'all got in the works? Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a fun year for poker coaching. We we added a lot of new coaches. We have some new strategies, and we're working on a, a big software to to really try to help our students in the kind of GTO space. It, it kind of goes back to the you know solver conversation we had um, in the past, where it feels like people are just getting thrown in the deep end and they're losing the fundamentals. They're not they're not focused enough on what's important about a solver, and they're just like. Oh, I bluffed off the sand and the computer says I did it. Like, I'm great. You know what I mean? And uh, and so we're trying to lean into kind of that aspect of an ad coaching and software. So we'll, we'll, we're, we have released it to uh, select members and we'll be going um, public very, very soon with the, it's called Peak GTO. Um, nice. And so I, there's certain, certain areas in there that, that I think are going to be really good. And it's been a lot of fun to work on. You know, it's, it's I'm working with Brock Wilson, Chris Brewer, John Little, uh, David Peters doing some stuff. So we added David Peters and Chris Brewer, um, a number of other coaches. It's, it's been it's been really fun, man. It's it's been fun. We have a great community, a good group of students. So just trying to give them as much value as we can with with some of the best training material in the market. Awesome, man. That's 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 great to hear. And you know, I I want to my my jujitsu coach um, used to tell me that like the simple things. You know, people under undervalue this the simplest things, the the basic techniques that you know you do over and over and over and over again. And I think that like this has happened in in poker at a much crazier level than than even jujitsu. Where like you know in jujitsu people lean towards the sexy thing, right? They they want to like be able to like do this super low frequency submission that that they can hit um all, basically almost never because it actually needs to be set up by like three different things to even have the opportunity so like but you want to like learn the submission right when you you have to realize that like oh there's steps to this like you you have to actually you've got to like try to pass the legs first and then you you've got to try to pass the hips and then you you know you've got to like isolate an arm like you got to go through it like sequentially and i think that in poker um one thing that it just drives me absolutely crazy is that you know i I have people reach out to me about coaching or, or courses um and then the like or, or like GTO uh, solver software recommendations, um, but then they'll they'll say something like, "Well, you know, like yeah, I I bought Preflop Bootcamp, which is my course, and um, but I haven't like really I haven't like really learned it yet." And I'm like, "Dude, like, why? Like, I I don't understand. Like, there's this like low hanging fruit. Like, learn your fucking preflop hands. Learn equities. Learn pot odds. Have this memorized. If you don't know how often." Um, a pot sized bluff needs to get through so that you auto profit, then you have fucked up if you're trying to look at a solver because like that that <laughs> just please value the fundamental things uh, in poker. And if you invest energy into those things, it is actually crazy how much better you will get faster than if you just go into GTO wizard and try to start memorizing stuff and try to start clicking around. Yeah. Um, you're, you're essentially the guy that's like starting standing up and like just trying to get somebody in the guillotine. Like, then there's like, dude, there you got you can't do it. There's no hope. Like, you've got no hope. Yeah, I I, I could not agree more with you. I, I think it's uh, I I got I got really lucky in my career. I came up just before the the public data. You know, I was I was doing EV calculations on a pen and paper, and I, I mean, to me, a pen know, and paper, like- not not even poker stuff. Well, yeah, we had uh, card runners EB or whatever, but there, there was, some, but like no, but like I, my my old notebooks are just filled with this stuff, you know, yeah. just like simple calculations and good fundamentals. Um, and and now you like, 
in my mind, and this is like not a, a hit at, at people, but in the GTO Wizard era, in the public solver era, how many new players have came up and reached the high stakes, right? Like, like I don't mean to shit on some of the younger guys, but like how many are out there that are like 22, 23, 24, like coming into live high stakes and crushing, yeah. right? It, it's, it, it just doesn't really happen very much anymore. And I think a big reason of that is that it's just so easy. It, it is spoon fed to people that don't want to do the hard stuff. They, they don't want to have good fundamentals. They don't want to focus on their global frequencies. They want to see if their one combo and some weird little node does something. It's like, what good is that? You know, it's, uh, we were talking before the call. It's like, I learned that there's a, there's a different skill set. And I had a big kind of fork in my road because I was into data and into all these solvers things. And I realized that there's a big difference between a poker theorist and a poker player. And a poker theorist can, it's, it's not, it's not hard to build data. You can spend, I could literally take anybody and spend two weeks with them and they can be making world-class data. You know what I mean? It's like, it's not that difficult. Um, but what they get used to is they get used to looking at a range and talking about why it does certain things or how it's looking or what the shape is or whatever. Whereas the best players can go from zero to a situation to build their own range, right? And that's a different skill set, looking at a pre-solved range and understanding what's happening versus building your own range in a sustainable way for you. And, and that, I think, is, uh, this side has been lost. And that's, that's why you haven't had a bunch of new, great, young poker players just like come through. It's also, there's also other reasons, right? It's hard to get your first 100K. It's hard to like do certain things. Sure. But, but I do think that like the, the solvers and the access to data have made people a lot weaker um, in terms of their habits and their process of, of understanding the fundamentals. Yeah, and I, I came up in the um, you know poker stove just running running sims like just running equity calcs again and again and again and again and again and again and like that became like really second nature to me just running these equity calcs i got better at them because i did it you know thousands and thousands and thousands of times and it does make me wonder like people that skip that step these days because they don't have to do it anymore um what kind of negative effects is, is it having on their ability to play poker at a high level um and you, you meant you know you mentioned building strategies or building ranges like and this is dynamic. Like you should be dynamically building ranges and dynamically building strategies based on the variables and the data points that you're seeing and observing. Um, and you know, like I, a, a friend of mine, he's he's an older gentleman who is I, I love him. And if you're listening to this show, I'm going to apologize in advance. Um, theoretically and fundamentally, not the strongest poker player, right? But he has studied live reads more than most humans on the planet. And so like he can see a live read, get a live read, and then his three bet range is pure. It becomes like, oh, I just three bet everything because like I have this live read, right? And his ROI in, in like live tournaments is somewhere between like 40 and 60% um, over over like many years, like six or seven years, right? And like, it's just that that to me just shows like, there's more to this game than looking at looking at the solvers and then being like, well, I got it. I got it. I got to figure it figured out. I'm a crusher now. Um, but for some reason, I can't crack this 25 and L. Like 25 and L is just like stumping me. Dude, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I want to try hard not to be too negative, you know, but yeah. it's like if you can't figure out how to beat 200 and L with good fundamentals, like, like what's going on, right? You know what I mean? Like so many people that like want backing or want something. So what, like it's prime course. dope, dude. <laughs> it's prime yeah. dope. Yeah. There are so many people that are on the 0.1% negative variance run. <laughs> it's so tough, dude. It's so tough. The game is the game is so much more difficult than people think. And the um, the I, I miss something uh I I mean this is something like I, I you know I used to study with with Ali, you know, before he kinda um, but before that whole thing happened, yeah, and I met him after the GG stuff and, and whatever. But he always just said that the bar is so low. He's like the bar that people have of working hard and studying hard is so low, and that always stuck with me because it's like you know when you're grinding up. I always thought that a lot of these guys were amazing players. You know, you you see like these guys that have been playing the two Ks for forever, and then you get up there and you're like, okay, maybe I I found an edge, and you, you go up above, above again and over and over and over. And it's like there are certain things these guys are all doing good, but the bar just isn't that high in poker. If you really dedicate yourself and you really, really work hard, 
you, you really can like just become very strong and find win rates in, in certain games. And the, the sky really is the limit. I feel like if, if you have a good process with it all, if you're lazy and you just want good answers and you want a crutch to say that you're allowed to bluff the king five with the heart or whatever, like it's just going to be tough for you. It's, it's going to be really, really tough. Yeah, John, uh, you know, my my partner in Wolves and Tactical Tuesday co-host uh, says, you know, all, all the time that like, dude, poker is like, it's not a super competitive industry. Like people are just not competing at a super high level. And he's yeah. like, it, like, because he he equates it to like the finance market, right? And like day traders Absolutely. and that and that market. And he's like, dude, like, it's like poker's a fucking joke. Like how people work in poker is a joke compared to like these other industries where people are like, everybody's actually trying really, 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 really hard. Um, so I mean, think about what a doctor has to go through post-college. Mm. Finish college. They have four years of medical school, like hardcore medical. They have to study for an MCAT to get into medical school. Yeah. And they have four years of medical school. And then they have like a three-year residency with different, it's like seven years of like a absolute grind. Yeah. How many of, of people are taking poker like that? Right, right, right. There just, just aren't aren't people trying that hard, and so it's like, yeah. But but then it, it then it goes with the idea that there aren't that many new faces, so it's weird. It's it's tough, right? It's uh, I don't know. I'm gonna have a better better idea of like of it in in ten years, I'm sure. But for now, I'm gonna just like try to keep taking it as seriously as possible and see where it takes me in all these different games. Like if I apply my process to do seven. I have to think I'm going to become a very strong player do seven in the next year or two. Like if I really dedicate the right hours, have good fundamentals, get good coaching, um, learn from people better than me, put volume in, work hard. Like it's not that difficult of a process, right? Yeah, it, it can't be. Like I, I, I just, so. it, it can't be. Um, and that sounds like, you know, a great note to end on, you know, your conquest of mixed games in the future and going for WSOP player of the year. And um, yeah, hope to be, seeing more of you in the near future and always great, you know, ca- catching up and spending time together. Really appreciate you. And um, let's do this again in the near future. Yeah. Thanks so much, man. Thanks for having me. Pleasure, man. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Coach Brad approved. Are you a lone wolf searching for the ultimate pack? The CPG Wolf Program is a close-knit brotherhood hell-bent on one thing only, chasing poker greatness. Powered by bleeding-edge wolf strats and led by Coach Brad and his lieutenants, CPG Wolves are systematically prepared for almost any spot they'll encounter on the green felt. If you want to plug into an elite team and have a step-by-step game plan to realize your full poker potential, you can apply at cpgwolves.com. Space is limited, and the pack is only as strong as its weakest member. So only the hungriest, grittiest, and most driven will be accepted into the program. Applications are open at cpgwolves.com